Thursday night we had to call out some of this. Yeah, probably. It might need to be edited a bit. Yeah. 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 All right, we're, we're, we're in session here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Cliff, you want to call the attendance? Councilor Brown? Here. Councilor Judith Garcia is absent. Councilor Teneri Garcia is absent. Councilor Lopez? Here. Councilor Robinson? Here. Councilor Recupero? Here. Councilor Vido? Here. Councilor De Jesus? Absent. Councilor Hattleberg? Here. Councilor Vega? Absent. And Councilor Taylor? I'm here. Oh, it's good to see you. Seven members present. You have a quorum. The Chelsea City Council will hold a meeting of the subcommittee on conference Monday, November 13th at 6 p.m. to discuss the fiscal year 2024 tax rates. Okay, I'll be calling on uh, Mr. Ned Key to give us an overview on the taxes and fiscal year 2024 valuation update. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Ned. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm uh, here with Jim Sullivan, our chief assessor, and we're um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about how we set valuations and uh, and uh, the resulting tax rates. Um, Tonight, this is simply an overview and a presentation. There are actions that the City Council needs to take to finalize a tax rate, and we'll be taking those actions, uh, proposed to take those on, on December 4th. If you turn to the, um, uh, to the packet that you have in front of you and you turn to the last page of that packet, you're gonna see the two actions that uh, tonight's uh, presentation will be leading up to. And, um, uh, so on December 4th, there needs to be a tax rate classification hearing, and that's a public hearing. And, um, and uh, as we have in past years, we'd recommend the two following votes. Um, uh, the first is to shift the residential. Uh, we have a, uh, a uh, uh, two-stage tax rate here. We have a residential rate, and we have a commercial industrial rate. We've always carried that in the past, and we've shifted that burden um, from residential to to, uh, to the commercial industrial rate um, at the maximum shift that's allowed by state law, which is 175%. Um, and then the second action that we have traditionally taken is um, to, uh, to uh, vote a 35% residential exemption. That means for anyone that resides in their home in Chelsea, they're able to take a, uh, there's a 35, there's a, this year it will be j just about $3,000 a household um, reduction in the, uh, uh, in taxes due on the average house, uh, owner occupied uh, house in Chelsea. So uh, with that, uh, I'll walk you through um, the work that uh, Jim's office, um, Jim Sullivan, has been doing uh, for the past year. In the first slide, you'll see that um, we need about $255 million to operate uh, the city in FY24. That is a combination of appropriations uh, that you voted the, uh, the budget, and that's a combination of the city and the school budgets. 98 million for the city and 132 million for the uh, uh, school department. We also, uh, uh, in that tax factor, we have water and sewer costs, uh, which we pay for through the uh, rate settings, uh, directly uh, through the water and sewer system. And then we have overlay reserve, which are any abatements that we may grant uh, this coming year, as well as um, uh, ex uh, uh, statutory exemptions that we grant. And then finally, the charges from the Commonwealth that uh, are, uh, are imposed by, by the Commonwealth onto each municipality in Massachusetts. So those total about 255 million. Page four here is te uh, to tell you how we meet that $255 million need. Um, the first is that uh, we receive from the state a uh, state aid, and that's 130 million. Um, uh, the bulk of that is uh, state aid received for the school system uh, with a smaller percentage uh, uh, to the city. 
Uh, and um, if you skip down to local property taxes, this is um, a straight calculation that we, we perform that the um, state allows, and that is um, last year's uh, tax levy increased by two and a half percent. So the, uh, you'll all be familiar with the uh, two and a half percent uh, property increase that's uh, state law across Massachusetts. You're, we're allowed to, ev every community in Massachusetts is allowed to increase their tax levy by two and a half percent. And so over and above that two and a half percent, we also have new growth. And so this year, we calculate new growth um, in, in September and October for the prior year. And um, this year, that new growth is, uh, those are new buildings that come online in the city and uh, the resulting tax benefit from those. So we're in at about two million this year. Last year, we had a spectacular year, over three million. And, um, and more usually, we're at one or one and a half million in new growth. Uh, so when we're bringing on new um, apartment buildings here, new industrial buildings, uh, we capture that as new growth, and it's outside of the two and a half percent. And then um, finally, the um, the uh, you know that totals about two hundred and fifty-five million those items. But um, to you, you. You'll remember that when we voted the budget, we voted the need for reserves at about $253,000. Um, the year prior, we didn't need any reserves to close our budget. This year, we used $253,000. And um, maybe, uh, on average, we're usually between six and a million dollars to close our budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so, those, all those items together mean that to close this gap, we need to, we need to raise about 45 million in receipts, and that's motor vehicle, excise, room excise, meals, 40U, building permits, water and sewer fees. And, um, and so all of these revenues together are what constitute our ability to meet our budget and uh, finance city operations uh, next year. Um, I spoke a little bit about the uh, Prop 2 and a half. That's page 5 here. You can read that through for yourself. Um, and uh, this is just a simple uh, arithmetic of what we're, uh, how Prop 2 and a half works here. Last year, we, we had a tax levy of about $75 million. Increasing that by 2.5% means that we can raise another um, uh, just under two million dollars, under two and a half. So our total tax levy in this coming year is just about seventy-nine million. Um, that seventy-nine million is um, how to describe that. I think this says it more straightforward than I was just going to try to relay to you. So. Um, the two and a half percent here is doesn't mean that any property is limited to going up two and a half percent. What it means is that our total tax levy can go up no more than two and a half percent. So that means that depending on the value of your property, how that gets distributed, how that 79 uh, million gets distributed among the classes of property here depends on what the values of those properties are. And so turning to page, so we'll go through a little bit of the description of what the uh, FY23 valuation, um, this should say FY24 valuation process was, is. Um, and so the city, the, and um, the state requires us to, um, go through a valuation update every single year. And every five years, we're required to do a, uh, a full five-year reval. Our next full five-year reval will be coming up in FY25. But the, um, for the interim years, we do, uh, we're required to do a valuation 
of all the properties. To some extent, um, valuing residential properties is a bit more straightforward, and that's because there are a lot of sales. And so what Jim, uh, Jim Sullivan and his office perform are analysis of all the sales that come through by each class, and they adjust um, to the market all the value of all the other properties in that class in the city. It's a little more complex with commercial industrial for the reason that there are fewer sales in commercial and industrial. So Jim has sort of a uh, iterative process where he goes out, sends income and expense uh, requests to, uh, to businesses here. And, uh, and uh, based on those and based on our best projections, we are uh, then able to uh, determine the value of those commercial industrial properties. So um, in, uh, I think you've heard this before, but I'll just for the benefit of all of us uh, repeat that our, our valuations are just about, uh, just about 18 months. Um, uh, they lag the market. So the values that you're going to see on your property that we're attaching to your property this year is just about, um, just about a year and a half old. And uh, that's required by the state. Um, those values are uh, not current. They're just about a year and a half old. What, um, so in a rising market, we don't capture all of those value, all of that value as current value. In a declining market, we don't capture the declining value for a year and a half either. So this is state law. It's how we have to operate here. And, um, and uh, just a commentary on why you might, we very rarely have people come and tell us they don't think we're capturing the full value of their property. But in fact, in a rising market, we're capturing that value of about 18 months ago. So. So on page 10 is the relevant market value data for this year. And you'll see that by class, this list by class, the uh, change in values uh, from FY23 to FY24. Single families have gone up uh, just 11.2%. Uh, Condos have gone up 6.5%. Two families, 7.4%. Three families, 8.6% apartments, uh, which are four plus uh, buildings in Chelsea, 8.9. Commercial properties, 8.3, and industrial properties, 17.8. Um, just for your general reference, um, the, um, the, the residential classifications here, which run all the way from, from single family to uh, apartment buildings here, represent about 75% of the value of real estate in Chelsea. The other 25% is commercial industrial. If you, um, we've made a few changes in our valuation of commercial industrial over the past few years. And uh, last year we focused on mixed use properties here and uh, went through a deep analysis to make sure we're capturing correctly the value of those properties. This year, we, uh, Jim, conducted uh, with consultants uh, examination of the 540 commercial industrial properties. Um, three years ago, we went through and we examined all of the uh, four plus units in the city. So we uh, have at this year concluded this sort of intensive three year process of making sure all our apartment style buildings, as well as our commercial, industrial, and mixed use are aligned with um, market expectations here. It's one of the reasons why um, we've been able to, why you've experienced very little increase in tax rates over the past two years, I'm sorry, in, in, in a decline in tax rates over the past couple of years because our values have increased um, uh, uh, substantially over those years. And we have experienced a little of that this year, but not quite as much as last year or the year before. Um, 
what we have done this year is capture about um, just a little over 17% of new value in commercial industrial. So that's not new growth, it's simply um, bringing those properties up to market value of 18 months ago. So, um, in, as you can understand, in when we make these sort of big moves, um, there's uh, a fair amount of um, It can generate a fair amount of abatement claims to the city and contesting values. And we think we got our values right. And, um, and uh, so we do put aside money in our overlay reserve to make sure that that potential exposure for when we may have gotten values wrong, and if, if we did get them wrong, then we would owe those funds back. So. Um, to that end, um, let me just see, to that end, uh, I'm gonna just skip ahead, um, perhaps to, um, to what this means, what, what, the, what, the, um, what the new tax rate is, so, and what we're experiencing this year, so, um, At least, uh, if I could just talk for a moment about residential exemptions and uh, page 13. And uh, as I said when I opened up, there's a 35% residential exemption that we typically vote. The value of that residential exemption would be $3,000 this year. That means, um, and I can go through what that means for owner-occupied units here. So. Um, we, we actually grant the maximum exemption that's allowed by state law, and um, with that, um, with the 35, um, uh, uh, so the residential rate in this coming up this year is going to be 1183 per thousand. That's down from last year, which was 1241 per thousand, and the commercial rate with the 1.7 per percent tax shift will be 2401, which is down from 24.92. That's on page 13, just at the, f at the foot of page 13. So with the expansion in value this year, our tax rates have dropped slightly. <coughs> what, that, um, what that means is that uh, on page 15, if you walk through, there's a table there to walk through uh, where I can walk you through what the average, um, the median assessed value by class is here. And if you, this lists out single family condo, two family and three family. With that and the new tax rate and the shift of um, 175 to the commercial industrial side, including the ta exemption, it means that the, um, the, av the, the difference in the tax bill for, these, uh, for the median value for each of these classes would be, in the single family, it would be um, about an 8% increase. In condos, it's a decrease of 2.96%. In two families, it's an increase of 2.25%. And in three families, an increase of 3.91%. So you'll see in the, fine, uh, the third column to the left, the difference in a tax bill for each of these classes would be about $212 for a single family. Condos will go down about $44 for the year. Two families will increase $103, and three families will increase $243. So that's based upon an owner-occupied residence here, and the median value of those uh, in each of those classes. That's a generally, by, by region, that's a generally strong story. It's a, um, it isn't the, it isn't what we experienced in the past two years, which were overall declines in 
the tax, the, the actual tax obligation in, in, in several of these classes for the past two years have declined, even as values have skyrocketed. Uh, and as you can see in the earlier value table, values have increased here, tax rates have dropped, but with the exemption and the tax shift, the changes in the, the annual change is a modest increase in each of these classes. I think it's helpful to walk through what the city does to assist, um, sort of uh, on page 16, to assist homeowners here and, um, and owner, um, owner occupants here. Um, and so we have both, um, and I'll walk through each of those for you. The, 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 the first is that the council voted several years ago uh, to fund a homeowner's assistance program. And um, the, uh, this is for folks who, homeowners who may have impacts from COVID. That was the initial, um, and may still be experiencing uh, 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 economic impacts uh, from COVID. So this was um, less, th th this is a income, uh, 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 income restricted uh, program, but it does, um, it provides grants uh, of up to $5,000 for families, uh, for one families in condos, two families $8,000, and three to four families uh, $10,000. Um, in, in this year, um, in this year, um, those, uh, uh, we have assisted about 95 homeowners with that uh, through this program and uh, 680 residents who reside in these buildings. So um, in the past year, we've expended about 200,000 of that fund. There's 50,000 remaining in the fund and um, it's open for applicants. So uh, if you have folks that come to you from this, we're, um, please encourage them to, uh, there's a link on the, uh, Housing, <coughs> housing and community development website to this program and an application there, or they can call their housing and community development office. Um, there are other um, uh, other programs that the state uh, that the city has adopted. There's statutory exemptions, and those include uh, um, uh, clause 17E, which benefits those 70 years and older those who own and occupy their homes. And um, for this, there are no income limits. Um, there are asset limits, and the value of the exemption is about $228 this year. I believe that that, because we voted to double those statutory exemptions, I think that benefit is now, it is double that. So um, just about $450 a year. Um, there's another um, clause 41B is available to those who are 65 years or older that has both income and asset limits on it, which are detailed here, and the value of those are just about um, uh, $1,000 annually. And so, um, and I think you're all may recall that for small commercial owners here, um, the council voted to adopt uh, personal property. If, if the business has personal property under $10,000, then that personal property is uh, fully exempt. Um, so just to reiterate uh, for you, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the in order for us to uh, where every municipality is required to conduct an annual tax rate classification hearing, and we'd like to schedule that for December 4th, um, public hearing, and that is where the council can, sit, can consider the uh, shift uh, to commercial industrial of, um, of the uh, tax rate shift to commercial industrial of 175%, and it's also where they can uh, consider the 35% residential exemption. So, 
Thank you. Uh, Jim is here for any questions, as I am. So. All right, thank you. It's a first sure. question, I'll go to Councilor Recupero. Jim. And I have a question. There's something here that um, maybe you can explain to me better. Here you have one, two, and three families, right? At a, at a certain rate. Then you go commercial, 8.3, and industrial. What is the difference between commercial and industrial? What's that mean? That you don't have buildings over the bigger buildings. You only go up to four. Is that, does that mean that commercial is the bigger buildings? Yeah, that, no, no. All residential buildings, it's a four plus. So the class starts at four units or more. So it can go from four units to 350 units. Right, it can mean anything at 400 units, 200 units. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so yeah. what is the commercial and industrial the difference? Commercial is what? I thought commercial, they were both industrial, commercial and industrial. What is Jim, the difference? Yeah. A commercial property would be like an office warehouse, I mean an office building, a place of business. Industrial is more warehouses, refrigerated houses, logistics space. Like things you'll see along Beecham Street and Eastern Ave, those will be considered industrial. They don't, they'll, people will work there, but it's mostly for storage, where ret your retail spaces will so be. What would hotel be? How would you classify that? That's, that's uh, commercial. That's commercial? Yes. So the everything else. Is just like KM. I'm sorry? KM is an industrial place. Council, yes. use your mic. I can't hear you on TV. Huh? Use your mic. KM is industrial, right? I'd have to check that, but it, exactly what, what classification. All right, and, and uh, another question I have, too. On the residential exemption, right, that, that we get, and it didn't really make a big dent on three-family homes. Like, even if we go to 35%, this really didn't make a big dent on them. That's precisely what it's supposed to do. Anytime we do anything in assessing, we have to call class, uh, get passed with a PID. It's a price ratio differential, something like that. But what it's doing, it's a flat amount. So therefore, the basis of it is it if it'll have the greatest impact on the people with the least amount of money, assuming the people with the lower values. So three family values, are, they're all selling for over a million dollars now. So on a percentage basis, it'll impact you less because your property is worth more and that's what it's supposed to do. That's why it isn't a ratio based upon your value. It's a flat amount across the board. So all three families are valued the same or all three families are valued different depending on the side of the city? No, everything's valued differently. That the residential exemption amount is a flat amount for every single residential property that gets it. All right, thank you. Councilor Hattelberg. Um, okay. How much did we actually lose in uh, in challenged uh, tax payment? I believe last year was about two million dollars, or two and a half million dollars. We had 250 abatements, um, or should I say, ATB cases in the past couple of years, which is an astronomical for a city yeah. with 6,500 properties. So we had to keep a large amount of money aside. We are fully funded. We have those seven million dollars in there now. Yep. So there's plenty of note. We're down to 75 cases, and Essentially, there were four or five property owners, four or five attorneys who are representing some of the larger yeah. landlords. How many pending cases do we have? How much exposure do we have, like right now? Right now, of the 75 cases, I'd have to give you an exact number on that. But so you we feel we have enough? Is really oh, absolutely. We're, okay. we're more than adequately funded. How much do you think we need to overfund or cautiously fund the overlay account for next year? depending on what, our, uh, what abatements we get to issue and what the board decides, whether yeah. they're granted or not, or what gets settled at the ATB. Yeah. I can give you a better number at that. But the ratio we're at now, we're, we're fine. Okay. So you're not, I guess my takeaway then, you're not going, we're in trouble here, we gotta really scramble, you're going, we just need to be prudent. No, I think, exactly. I think, I think we'll be in a good spot. Okay. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just had a question regarding the new growth. I wanted to know, um, I heard Ned say um, last year our new growth was about three million, this year was about two. Is that correct, Ned? Yes. Um, what contributed to the decrease in that? Well, not necessarily a decrease because historically we've been between one and one and a half million correct. dollars worth of growth. So we had 
back-to-back -back years, we had astronomical numbers because of projects like Vail Street and all the hotels being built. Now they're coming to a close. So we have stuff in the pipeline. Um, next year, I have a, a large growth number coming in on uh, manufacturing of a million and a half that we already have. It's just not, not counted this year. We abated somebody. We actually audited their personal records. So that's coming in. So this, this number is it's less than last year. It's still higher, much higher than before. But again, a lot of these properties have, have been completed, and you're just not seeing as much, as much growth as the past couple of years. Okay, thank you. In, in regards to the ATB uh, cases, how many relate to the affordable housing group? The majority. Could you give us a number? Um, I can give you an exact number if I looked them up. I know we have 75 cases because they're going for multiple years. So each address could have four years worth of abatements at the ATB. So again, there are, there's only about five or so property owners that are at the ATB and they're typically at. But I can give you exact figures on that. Please, thank you. Yeah. And I, Leo, I'd, I'd add one thing to that, which is we're sort of experiencing the result of our valuation of our four plus uh, uh, asset class from mm -hmm. three years ago. So that's what we're living with now. We expect actually to see from our, our mixed use and our, our commercial industrial that we're going through this year, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, challenges to those values as well. So it, it does go in cycles depending on where we have the most dramatic uh, value change. Right. Um, I, un I understand that. So I'm an I'm an affordable housing group, and I I buy a piece of property that's valued at eight million, and then in return I turn and sell it to Cliff for five million. How much taxes are we losing because of this kind of quick exchange uh, transition? Um, as far as you're talking the valuation of low income properties, yeah. On different, it depends upon the building and the building type, but 40 to 50 percent is not unusual for a, for a residential property. Thanks. I just want to follow up on my colleague question and just stand in with me. Um, Council Recupero asked the question about CAM and how we, what type of description or how we evaluate it. You're not sure if it's commercial and in, um, industrial. I believe it's industrial. They're taxed at the same rate. So oh, they okay. Yeah, so it's it's honestly there's a, a there's a residential rate and a commercial rate. Sometimes the differences of in the description they're not going to impact value if it's in a three thousand class or four thousand class. Okay, because that was my second question. I was going to ask what they were taxed at. Thanks, Councilor Tamale Hero. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question about the thirty five percent residential. Um, if I remember correctly, that's the most that we can right. get. And in the past, this council has moved up incrementally until we reach the 35%. And my question is, how long have we been at 35%? And then I'll ask the second question. I believe it's been two years. I remember it's, I've been here I'm in my sixth year. It was 31%, and I think it mm -hmm. went down to 35 mm -hmm. because there was an impact when we did the res when we revalued the residential pieces. Um, the same rate in time, it would have been a dramatic increase mm -hmm. for the residents, so we just raised the 35 to offset that. So okay. it would give them more of a break. And so what happens moving forward as prices continue to get high and the values go up, but we're not able to give more than that 35% for someone on a fixed income, let's say? Because um, there's no more that we can give, right? And so that's the most. Do you foresee this being a potential issue for some people with fixed incomes or um, I, I can't really speak on that because I, I know that don't know their personal financial yeah. issues. Um, if you look at the numbers for in the packet here, the typical single family home, the residential exemption is going to reduce their tax burden by more than 50%. The shift will take another 2000 off of it. Mm -hmm. So they're already getting $5,000 knocked off if they were in a typical community that didn't have a shift or a split tax rate or a residential exemption. So. Um, for, to be, I mean, again, I don't know the person, the, the economic situation, but 
for the average single family home, it's, it's about a little over, it's about 55, 60 dollars a week for taxes. A week? That's what it breaks down. So that's what the tax rate will be on this with the, with the exemption. So again, depending on what they have. And I just add that there are statutory exemptions in the back that I mm -hmm. described briefly. So for anyone over 65 or 70, those are supplemental to the, uh, to the uh, exemption, the 35% exemption. Uh, so, so I think that that's where council has stepped in to say, you could, uh, if, if, if you have an asset or income, uh, uh, if you're in an asset or income class, you can gain something more off your taxes here. Okay. So. I just, for me, mm -hmm. on this side, it felt good to be able to give this incremental exemption sure. to one of the tenants that have mm -hmm. power in the The uh, taxpayer can get the residential exemption, one statutory exemption, and participate, participate in a veteran or a senior work off. You get another $1,500 a month there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Todd Taylor. Thank you. Um, just to kind of put this in a general perspective, um, and I guess this question would probably be more for Ned, but um, how does Chelsea compare to other municipalities in the amount of exemption and assistance that we provide to our residents um, as opposed to you know the other municipalities in, in, in the Commonwealth? Well, you're, you're granting the maximum. Uh, you've, grant, you've adopted all the statutory exemptions and you adopted the doubling of those. So uh, that's for older folks here in the city. And then the 35% is the maximum the state allows. So, uh, so I get that. But I'm, the, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm asking, how, do we compare? Where, how, how many other communities around the Commonwealth do this? 13. 13, thank you. Hmm? No, 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 that, that, that provide the maximum residential yeah. exemption, 13. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, 13 have a residential exemption. Mm -hmm. So not all of them have the maximum. Uh, yeah, how, 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 many, how many, do you know how many? I can look that up, I can go to the state website. But yeah. relatively few. So, so my point, my point is, is that we we have we have done pretty More. much all we can do yeah. in, in this respect for helping our residents, um, you know, um, pay their tax bills and make it make it easier on them, and that, you know, this is this is unique in municipalities across the Commonwealth. That's my that's my point. That's correct. Is that, I mean, is that a correct uh, uh, assessment? Think, uh, in my personal opinion, this is very generous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank, thank, thank you. I just, want, I just want everybody to understand that. Council Lopez. Yeah, um, I have a question regarding, uh, do we have another program where we help uh, a homeowner who lives in the property that uh, work a few hours also and get tax deductible for that? We have a senior tax workoff program. Senior, senior? We do, and so that's beginning in uh, for anyone in your district, or uh, that's that uh, you can apply uh, in. Um, I think we start taking applications in January, and um, so I'll confirm that it's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. So we run the program from just about February to October, and in that uh, during that time. Uh, uh, you can apply, uh, you can come to the uh, city, to the uh, Human Resources Department, submit an application, and we'll do a placement for you uh, to the extent that we can in one of the city departments or, uh, or divisions uh, to assist us. Okay, the person has to live in that building. How old that person has to be and how much he, will, he or she will earn if, if the person qualify for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these programs, the senior work off and the veterans work off are handled by human resources. Mm -hmm. So they're the best service. But I believe it, it's a 60 years old now to be in a senior work off. Okay, it used to be 65, I believe. Now it's down to 60. And the veterans work off, unfortunately, we didn't have any veterans apply. Um, Francisco can assist somebody in that. But they can earn up to $1,500 to uh, 
still a good test. And how long that pro is that program for? How many months? Uh, until they finish their hours. They have a certain amount of time to finish. I believe it's 100 hours worth of time. All right, thank you. Councilor Cooper. We have the senior program. I changed it to 60 years old. It used you to be 65. Councilor, use your mic, please. Well, here's, another, here's a question I wanted to ask you. Councilor, use your mic, please. Uh, here's a question I wanted to ask you. On these, um, and affordable housing units, when they come in, right, they come into the city, and they have, let's say, affordable housing, market rate housing. Does the city lose money with affordable housing, or does it gain money? Because if we lose money, who gets the shift? Do we, do we gain money from these big apartment? We got all these big apartment units come in, right? Half of them, let's say, have 20 affordable housing units and the rest are market rate. Do they get the same rate as anybody else or their rates change and they pay less tax? The affordable units will be valueless. They'll pay the same tax rate, but there's certain items that create uh, the value in an apartment building, for example. It's the income, they'll get a reduced income rate, and their so expense ratios are higher, therefore it lowers their value and they have so a higher tax rate. So in other words, they pay less tax. Yes, for the affordables they do. That's, that's, so, so who makes up the difference of the tax that they lose? Let's say we have 10,000 apartment buildings that are all affordable housing units, right? And you have 5,000 that are not affordable housing units. So the cost will be passed on to the ones that are not affordable housing units. Huh? But th th he just answered the question in one way, right? He says they revenue is less, so the city loses money. That he just answered it. He just mm -hmm. said it. They lose money, so the well, huh? Well, whatever. Yeah. But let, let's say we want to put more affordable housing units here, right? How much affordable housing units can this city withstand, to your opinion? Before, so uh -huh. I, just as a, I, it's a matter of city policy. We we did uh, the um, we've done a number of market rate projects here. Some of the new growth that uh, Calvin was referring to earlier was the result of this uh, large project over on Everett Avenue, and so uh, Vero, and so um, in other places uh, where. For example, the Midas site, which was kind of a derelict site up on uh, the upper part of Broadway. We made the decision to do an uh, uh, affordable project there. That project is, on, on average, a higher value project than Midas, than the one-story Midas building was. But to your point, if we had done a market rate project there, we would have captured more value. So we had a, a one-story commercial building. We, we made the decision to do an affordable housing project there, but if we had done a market rate project, we would have captured greater growth and a greater annual. But, but we have done, one north is largely, is, is a market rate project, Vero is. We have, we, we have a number of projects that are largely market rate, so we, we realize those gains that you're talking about on market rate uh, apartment buildings in several, in, in various sites around the city and in some we reserve for affordable, uh, largely affordable uh, housing units. But I, I understand what you're, what you're saying. I'm not against affordable housing. Affordable housing is needed in that city. The only thing I'm trying to understand and try to make the people understand that there's different kinds of affordable housing. There's affordable housing and there's market rates. You have a building that has 100 units. If they only have 12 units that are affordable, they get a discount, they get a rate, a different rate. And the other ones are market rate, which make money. You try to rent a market rate apartment. It's $3,500 for a three bedroom. Mm -hmm. So I don't, that's the part that I'm trying to understand. That I understand how it works, because I, I know I've been here long enough to see how it is. But I want the public to understand, too, how it works. That when you do stuff like this, all of us don't get taxed the same. 
and the burden is put on the poor people that are renting homes. They're the ones that are being driven out. They're the ones they can't afford. Yes, it is. They can't afford to pay $3,500. You, I know people are telling me right now they have to leave this city because they can't pay $3,000 for a three bedroom, $3,500. They can't. So that's driven through market rate. Market rate drives the rent. If this building is getting $3,000 for a three bedroom, the other guy has no choice but to make $3,000 because he's got to pick up the difference. He's got to pick the cost up. And meanwhile, if they have a building like that, that that's, that's the thing that I'm trying to prevent within this city. I'm trying to keep the city with the people that are here to stay here. They're being gentrified even faster. I could see it in my own district where people are leaving left and right. They can't afford to live here. A single bedroom, one bedroom apartment in this city is $1,600 for a single one bedroom. And we keep going up and up and up. The only people that keeps paying is the poor people that live here. They pay, they can't live here anymore. They can't afford to live here. I've lived here 42 years and it's getting hard for me to live here. And I own my own place. I paid my dues, I, owned it, I bought it 43 years ago. And it's getting even harder for me. How do you expect poor people to come and stay in our city? They won't be able to stay. And, and then something else, we always have a surplus, surplus of money all the time. Why can't one year, don't pay, leave the tax rate alone and give the people an opportunity. If we have a surplus, why do we need to tax more? Like I look here, this year, we're, how many more millions are we have to use this year to catch up be, from last year? But if we have surplus money, why don't we use it to give the people a break, the ones that are here? And well, keep him here. That's the part that gets me. Everybody yeah. gets a break. But the poor people that live here, they don't get it. Huh? Counselor, counselor, through the chair. Well, you giving them a break in what? In, in, in your residential exemption? They gave me a residential exemption. I come, if I'm getting a break, why then my tax went up $400? Oh, 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 oh. Do you want a counselor. house? Stop. No. stop, stop. No. Counselor, counselor. If we decide not to raise the taxes, it's only going to get double next year when we have to pay the bill. I, I, I understand we have to raise the tax. I, I get that because you have the expenses you have to do. I understand that. I'm not saying the city has to survive. Without raising your taxes, you can't survive. But the point is, if we got extra money, why can't one year keep the taxes the same and don't raise it? Doesn't why, it won't, it, it won't work that it way? It doesn't work that way. We need money for a rainy day fund for all these unexpected expenses that might arise in the year that we would, would have to address. And if we give the money away, we're not going to have I know any. that you have to have a certain amount of money within the budget so the yeah. city can get its rating. If it doesn't have that amount of money, the city will lose its rating. I understand that. I know that. I heard, they told me that before. But the point I'm trying to make is why all the time we can't give a tax my fellow counselor says, yes, they get a break. If I'm getting a 35% break, why can't my taxes stay the same instead of going up? That's the point I'm trying to make. I know they never stay the same, they go up. <laughs> you know, the city's doing a great thing. We're giving it an exempt. We're giving a lot because a lot of places don't give 35%. Right. I understand that. There's, there's two sides to everything, Mr. President. But the whole point I'm trying to make is we can do, like Mr. Taylor said, we're doing the maximum we can do for the people. I would like to do more. What could we do more? That's the whole point I'm trying to get at. We, we are doing the maximum, but there's always something to do more. So right. why can't we try to do more and try to keep the people that are here, here? We, That's the whole point. We, we, did, we did what we could in going to the 35%. I understand what, that. Right, I and that was a benefit That's, to the community. I just, I just wanna say that I think that my counselor colleague needs to know that his point has been made, it's, I, I, we, we get it. And, 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 I, and we, I think most of us agree, but there's nothing that we can do with this no. department as we're already doing the max that we can do here. And then, so, well, we need to look at it, maybe other policy situations that right. we can do to implement, but that's say. not gonna happen at this meeting. No, no. So I just wanna, I just want him, he keeps saying, I'm trying to make this point, I want him to know the point was made. Thank you. I understand, it's not I'll, I'll ask Ned, you wanna, you wanna wrap up to the council? Sure, well, thanks for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, come to Jim or myself over the next few days, and uh, 
we'll work with the council to schedule the public hearing on December 4 for the, uh, for the uh, uh, commercial industrial uh, shift and for the uh, exemption, 35% exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're, we're adjourned. Uh,